Thanks, John. Joe, how are you doing? Good, good. Uh, did you see this? You got a dog? No, can I see a photo? Council members. I didn't see you, Mark. I'm sorry. How are you? Great job. Who was there yesterday? Who? Uh, Bree? Bree? Councilmember Traegers, you're waiting for Helen. Okay, and who else are you waiting for? I try to start on time. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Without a therapist. So. He actually just started the S train on this morning. He cranked it himself. My outer borough coalition. What? I'm live. That's good. I'm live. Don't say anything I regret. The mic is hot. Uh, Jen, should I start? Okay, okay, okay. We're going to start. Come on in, Mark. Oh, here's, here's the majority there. Great, great. Hi, Lori. I, I kept, kept the spot. Uh, hi, me too. Good afternoon. Uh, on today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following land use items. I'm going to breeze through them unless you have any questions. I'm not going to go into detail on them. Uh, we have multiple actions today. Leverett's Boulevard rezoning in Councilmember Adams' district. 95 Lennox Avenue, it's an Article 11 in Councilmember Perkins's district, Lutheran Social Services of New York Early Life Children's Center 2 in Councilmember Salamanca's district, the Borum Hill Historic District Extension in Councilmember Levin's district, and 180 Myrtle Avenue uh, in, uh, I think that's in Councilmember Cumbo's district. Uh, so that's the land use for today. We're going to vote on the following pieces of legislation. We'll vote on the parental empowerment package. We first announced this package of bills uh, for Mother's Day, just before Mother's Day. Uh, and we are very proud to be voting on these bills today. People say it takes a village to raise a child, but sadly we know that uh, society all too often falls short when it comes to supporting parents and caregivers. This package of bills will help provide New York City families with exactly the type of support they need to raise healthy and happy families. I really want to thank my amazing colleagues who put this package of bills forward, especially our majority leader, Councilmember Lori Cumbo, as well as the Women's Committee uh, Chair Helen Rosenthal, who is on her way for their incredible advocacy in bringing these issues to light and their unwavering commitment to improving the lives of families across the city. Uh, introduction 913A, sponsored by uh, Chair Helen Rosenthal, will require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to submit a plan to increase access for doulas for pregnant people in the city, including relevant timelines and strategies. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will also report annually on known city and community-based programs that provide doula services and training areas with a disproportionately high rate of mater maternal mortality 
cesarean birth and other poor birth outcomes in the city and any updates to the plan. And when Councilman Rosenthal arrives, uh, she can speak on this. Uh, the second bill is also by uh, the council member uh, and that would expand uh, upon the report required by Local Law 55 in 2017 and it will require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to submit additional data on maternal mortality as well as information on severe maternal, maternal morbidity. The report will include more nuanced information such as information status, trimester of prenatal care entry, and pre-existing health conditions. The bill will require uh, the report to provide recommendations for enhancing agency cooperation to improve outcomes. And finally, the legislation will codify the Multidisciplinary Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee known as M3RC and require DOHMH to post online information and disciplines represented on the M3RC committee. I want to uh, have the council member, uh, Council Member Rosenthal, speak on these when she arrives. Uh, next, introduction 879A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, will expand upon existing laws to require any employer with 15 or more employees to provide a lactation room with a surface to place a breast pump and require that room to be in a reasonable proximity to an employee's work area and a refrigerator suitable for breast milk storage. And I wanna ask the majority leader to please speak on this important legislation. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson. I am a little under the weather, so you'll have to excuse me. My voice is a little bit different today. I thought and we your had- And son has been under the weather too. And my son has been under the weather too. I thought we had really done something when we passed uh, paid sick leave, but <laughs> he was sick for three days and I took him to daycare and they said, would you please bring him home so that he doesn't infect the rest of the center? <laughs> so we had to stay home for three days. And then during that time, I also got sick. There went my two days, my five days for the year are now officially done. Um, and I've been told that now that he started daycare, there will be many more sick days to come. But I am proud to bring forward this package, which takes a comprehensive approach to empowering parents across New York City. Last May, on my very first Mother's Day, I have long been an advocate for women, and particularly for mothers. But over the last 14 months, I have experienced firsthand pregnancy, postnatal care, and what it takes to then care for an infant while also balancing a demanding career. So much goes into a healthy pregnancy from birth, recovery, and then of course taking care of a child, which I just laid out. It is a challenge to be a mom, to be able to get out the door by 7.30 in the morning, having to get dressed, get your baby dressed, change the diapers, pump the milk, put the milk in the refrigerator, bring your pump, wash all the materials, wash the dishes, make breakfast, wash the dishes again, bring it all together, pack up your stuff, and get out the door all by 7.30 every single morning. So every day should be Mother's Day, and God bless all the mothers for all of the incredible work they do. And while I'm proud that this package empowers all parents, so much of the responsibility falls on women. In two or single parent households, or single parent households, for single mothers, 40% who are in poverty, there is still a significant gap in getting the support they need to provide for themselves and their families. We must meet the needs of mothers and meet them where they are at. Whether it is at their child's school, jail facilities, or at their workplace, all mothers and their children must be accounted for. All of, the, all of these broader goals, such as closing the gender and racial wage gap or increasing the number of women in politics, will not be achieved if we are not looking at what it truly takes for mothers, low-income, immigrant, women of color, single mothers to raise a family in this city. I am proud that this package addresses some of the key challenges faced by parents in this city, including lactation accommodations in public spaces and in the workplace access to diapers, and our city's high rates of maternal mortality, particularly for black and Latino women. Much more work still remains, but I'm proud of my colleagues and grateful to the advocates and community leaders who led the way for this concerted effort to truly make a difference in the lives of working parents across New York City. I would be remiss to mention that as we sit here, our federal government has yet to meet its promise to reunite all of the children and parents separated by their inhumane immigration policies. We cannot forget that parenthood and childhood are still a privilege for many, and we must continue to do all that we can to protect and support the mothers and all parents and children of this city. 
I want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, who did not blink an eye when I brought this Mother's Day package forward. I want to thank Helen Rosenthal, the chair of the Women's Issues Committee, Brenda McKinney of the Women's Committee, Prince, of course, my son, who inspired so much of this, because I'm such a better legislator and city council member, because now I do walk in the shoes of so many mothers across the city of New York faced with everyday challenges. Laura Popa, Jeff Baker, Jason Goldman, and to the mothers of New York City and all the parents whose work goes largely unnoticed and supported, but for whom we are here today, every day is Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, next, introduction 878A, sponsored by Councilmember Robert Cornegie, will expand upon Local Law 94 of 2016, which required lactation rooms in places like city health centers. And this bill will require that city jails that accept visitors and police precincts also offer lactation rooms to persons using on site services. If it is not practical for a police precinct or a jail to provide a lactation room due to security concerns or limited space, the bill requires that those agencies provide an explanation for why it is not practical, as well as information on any future plans to improve the availability of lactation rooms. And when Councilman McCornegie arrives, he can speak on this. Uh, next, introduction 905A, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, will require employers to develop, implement, and distribute all new to all new hires a written policy regarding the provision of a lactation room. The policy will include a statement that employees have the right to request a lactation room, identify the appropriate process for doing so, and provide guidance for what to do if two or more persons needed the room at the same time. The bill will also require the New York City Commission on Human Rights to establish and post online a model lactation room uh, accommodation policy and Councilor Rivera can speak on this if she arrives. And next, introduction uh, 380A, sponsored by my friend, Councilmember Mark Traeger, would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, to make available a supply of diapers and baby wipes sufficient to meet the needs of children, three years old and younger, at domestic violence shelters, temporary shelters, family justice centers, life programs, and city contracted childcare centers. It will also require visible signage or written notice of the availability of such diapers and baby wipes. Very important, Bill Mark. And I invite Councilmember Traeger to come up and speak on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, no parent should ever have to choose between buying diapers for their child and paying rent or putting food on the table uh, for their family. I am proud to be the primary sponsor of Introduction 380. Uh, as the speaker mentioned, a law that would provide diapers and baby wipes uh, to, to be made available uh, to child care centers, family justice centers, Department of Education life programs, <coughs> domestic violence shelters operated by HRA, and shelters operated by the Department of Homeless Services and DYCD. Diapers and wipes are an expensive necessity, mm -hmm. and many families struggle to afford them. The cost of diapers can especially be a hardship for single parents. In New York State, infant care can account for 55% of a single parent's household income, wow. and WIC and SNAP assistance cannot be used to pay for the cost of diapers. Studies show that moms who struggle to afford diapers are more likely to have depression, and babies who are exposed to dirty diapers are at risk of developing uh, potentially severe, long-lasting medical complications. Our city must show basic decency by, pr by providing clean diapers to families. Many child care centers do not allow infants to be dropped off without a supply of diapers. That's so true. Putting some parents in the uh, unenviable position of being unable to go to work or school because they have nowhere to leave their child. Furthermore, these children are missing out on early childhood programs that can be critical for their academic, social, and emotional development. I am so very proud that our city is stepping up to make sure that diapers are available to our families. This is common sense legislation, and I'm proud that we're taking a major step to do the right by, by New York families. This will be a historic day. I really want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and his office who have been so supportive every step of the way. There's so many technical things you have to kind of go through in, in government, and his office has been outstanding. My colleagues for their support, the majority leader for her inspiration as well. I want to thank Laura Popa, Jeff Baker, Brad Reed, who's done a great job negotiating with the administration. 
uh, Andrea Vasquez, Rachel Cordero, and Jason Goldman for their work, and to my staff, Anna Scape, Vanessa Ogle, and Eric Feinberg. And lastly, I'll share with you, uh, this was all started when a single parent came into my district office asking for help with, with food and diapers for her child. And I was shocked to learn that the shelter that she was staying in did not provide diapers for her child. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to thank my office staff for being a big, big part of this. And uh, this is a council that, that led the way in providing, I remember, uh, pads and tampons to provide basic de human decency. And we continue to lead the way to lift up families in New York City. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I want to invite uh, Councilmember Rosenthal to come up and talk about the two great pieces of legislation that she's passing today on the uh, maternal morbidity report as well as on uh, doula access and reporting. So Thank, much, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thanks, uh, good afternoon. I really do just want to start by thanking Speaker Johnson for his leadership in developing the parent empowerment package that we're set to pass today. Maternal morbidity and mortality, especially among black women, is a public health crisis. It's an acute system. It's an acute symptom of a far broader problem. It reflects the underlying sexism and racism in our society, and black women bear the brunt of both isms. The data says it all. Black non-Hispanic women in New York City are eight times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women, according to the preliminary numbers from the city. And white women, in the United States are already three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth than their counterparts in other industrialized nations. This past summer, the DOH announced a $13 million five-year plan to address maternal mortality and morbidity. The laws that we pass today will hold their feet to the fire. Intro 913A takes effect immediately, and within nine months and annually thereafter, DOH must publish their plan, including timelines and strategies to increase access to doulas for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. 914A codifies the robust multidisciplinary maternal mortality and morbidity review committee, which does a deep dive into each pregnancy related death. Beginning next o October and annually thereafter, DOH will have to report on instances and indicators of mortality and morbidity. Every five years, they will be required to issue a comprehensive and detailed report with updates on their work to minimize these tragic deaths. I'm proud to have sponsored these two bills in the package we are voting today. Voting on today, they're critical steps towards supporting pregnant New Yorkers and improving health outcomes for our mothers and their babies. I'd especially like to thank Chanel Porchia from Ancient Song Doula Services, who invited me to speak at their Decolonized Birth Conference. And thank you to the legislative team at the Council, the Human Services Division, and my legislative director. I appreciate it, Speaker of Johnson. Of course, of course, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, <clears throat> Lastly, we are voting on uh, introduction 853A, which is sponsored by uh, public advocate Tish James, and it will require the establishment of a working group to study the feasibility of providing discounted group child care services for children aged four and under of city employees. The working group would include experts in the field of child care and agency representatives and would issue a feasibility report in 12 months. The study would be followed by a pilot project to provide such child care at one or more centers. The public advocate uh, can't be at the press conference today, but I want to thank her uh, for this bill as part of the package. And that concludes our agenda for today's state of meetings. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes, and I'm happy to take any questions on any of these bills first, if anyone has any. Yeah, Jeff. The uh, forum bill, the, uh, does that have anything to do with the uh, jail and Brown Hill? Is anyone from Lanny's here? No, uh, I don't believe so. I think this has actually been going on for 
uh, years. I know that Councilmember Levin has really been working closely with the Borm Hill Association. It's a pretty significant extension. It's gonna cover 300 additional new buildings. Um, so it's fairly large and I think this, of course, given the, the Euler process and going to community boards, I think it predated the scoping. Uh, this, is, this is me not knowing totally, but my, my sense and guess is that this predated the scoping around the jail. It might have been part of some, I mean, the, the early conversations around the Brooklyn House of Detention, and this may have been happening at the same time, but I don't believe they were connected, but you should ask Councilmember Levin. Rosa? Well, and I'll turn it over to Councilman Rosenthal. Uh, the extensive work that we have done, and it's proven time and time again, access to doula care and prenatal care is really a huge aspect of what needs to happen. I know for myself and being an African-American woman, um, having a child, and I wasn't announcing everywhere that I was going that I was a city council member, um, there was never an opportunity or an instance where a doula was offered to me. And when I spoke about these things within the hospital, in terms of asking about a water birth or a midwife or doula or having a, a natural birth pregnancy, these things were really frowned upon in terms of, I'm an older mom, if there are complications, you need a doctor. So these types of things in terms of doula care, it's, it's, really, it's really a field that's very largely um, misunderstood in terms of exactly what a doula actually does. And so doula care has everything to do with pre, during, and post. And so particularly for single moms, this would be an incredible asset in terms of you know, many moms are working right up until the day that they have their baby when they probably should be on bed rest or if they need to be on bed rest. But a large part of this is um, infusing um, the options of doula care and prenatal care and more education uh, during that process. And also for people to take very seriously um, when an African American woman or a Latina woman um, is having a child in terms of those extra services. I mean, it's, it's now everyone understands the story of a Serena Williams, but it's knowing your body and being able to articulate what's happening to your body. I shared at one of the hearings that um, I had a cerclage while I was pregnant which means they have to stitch up your cervix. And a week before I had the baby, they take the stitches out. And then during my pregnancy, I was experiencing such pain, but then the doctors were saying, that's pregnancy, until the doctor realized they hadn't taken all the stitches out. So during my pregnancy, I didn't wanna have an epidural, but I had to have an epidural to take the stitches out so that I could then have the pregnancy. So it's really this concept um, which seems that it shouldn't be revolutionary, hearing what we're actually saying um, in the process. Well, I'm, that's just the perfect example. Um, and I would put it in the bucket of the isms, um, mm -hmm. that uh, as much as being pregnant is a normal state of health, it can add to somebody's stress level. And if you uh, think about what a doula does, who, someone who's not a medical professional, but is there to advocate on behalf of the woman. And in a way, um, Rosie, we can continue this afterwards. We should have put a pin in this discussion mm -hmm. because part of what we know to be the problem, Department of Health has done a fair amount of research on this, is that the medical profession doesn't listen to women so Lori's story is not uncommon. It was the story of Serena Williams. And there's much to be done in medical schools to train our professionals, I mean, and everywhere in the hospital, to train the institutions to listen to women. Uh, seems to be a common theme. So the story mm -hmm. limiting the bill in a way is meant to answer some of the problems that That's exactly. Well, that's exactly, well, that's exactly right. I mean, the two are a nice package because 
Um, there, we are codifying this very robust uh, M3RC, the review committee, which is the medical professionals who review the, um, the cases where there are bad outcomes. Included in that committee are doulas and other more non-professional um, uh, healthcare professionals who are not medical. And in fact, they're doing something very clever. They're uh, hiring storytellers to teach women like Council Member Combo how to tell their story and then go into Grand Rounds and talk about what happens to them. So there are all different ways that we are using to get in there, but we already know that doulas have a positive effect. The data shows, the New York City data shows that women with doulas have uh, higher birth weight, infants with higher birth weights and fewer uh, preterm uh, uh, infants and that the C-section rate is a little bit lower. Nationally, the statistics are that the C-section rates are a lot lower. And there's no question that with a vaginal birth, you're gonna have a better, a more successful outcome. Thank you. We don't have enough women in the city council, but the women that we do have are pretty amazing. And uh, we're lucky to have them because of the uh, experience, life experience, and advocacy that they bring. And also, I really want to thank ProPublica because they uh, did a pretty groundbreaking report looking at mm -hmm. African American women in New York City, mm -hmm. I think about two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which I think shed a lot of light on this for policymakers and elected officials. So I'm grateful for that investigatory journalism that took place. Anything else on these bills? Okay, off topic. Yes, sir. Uh, last year, Governor Cuomo uh, signed into law a bill that extended unlimited sick time to state employees who are at uh, surge at ground zero and have World Trade Center certified illnesses, and municipal employees from outside the five boroughs have unlimited sick time. Not considered in that legislation and cut out was a class of individuals like uh, from the EMT and the FDNY locals that serve down there are World Trade Center certified ill. There's been many accounts of them in the Chief and other papers who are now with only 12 sick days sometimes facing foreclosure, bankruptcy, and financial ruin. The administration has really refused to grant this as a matter of right. Do you support the idea that civil servants that serve down there that are city civil servants like these EMTs, that are World Trade Center certified illnesses should get unlimited sick time just like the FDNY and NYPD uniform services now in Dillon? So I didn't know about this, so thank you for bringing it to light, and the answer is yes. If you serve down on the pile, if you served at ground zero, you should be afforded all of the uh, care that's necessary to take care of yourself or your family and things that other people are able to enjoy. I mean, every few years we've had to have fights on the federal level on the Zadroga health bill and funding it for people who need healthcare services in the aftermath. And sadly, almost every single stated meeting of the city council, I have to read very mm -hmm. sadly the names of people who serve down at Ground Zero who are dying of 9-11 health-related um, issues. I'm not gonna get into it, I'm not gonna violate anyone's privacy, but there are people here at the city council who um, have struggled and who served down there and it has taken a toll on their health that they're still experiencing today, uh, almost 17 you know, years later, more than 17 years later. And so people should be granted this right. If there's a class of individuals who currently are not granting it, granted it, it's not right. Well, clearly that was a gigantic mistake and it was a misinformation that is still affecting people's lives to this day. So we as a government, especially anything that's 9-11 related, uh, because it's the you know most significant terrorist attack that's ever happened on American soil in modern history, that we have the obligation to take care of people. And so that's what we need to do. Jill? Um, do you have any concerns about uh, the Democracy NYC program that the mayor has launched? He sent some letters, uh, 400,000 letters this uh, week or last week uh, that many people received this week telling them that they were inactive voters. Uh, we've heard from many other people who were actually active voters and just found those letters confusing, thought they were maybe a scam or an attempt to get people uh, to think they weren't on the rolls. Uh, do you have any concerns about this, this office? 
Well, I think I should start by saying, of course, we want to improve voter turnout and civic engagement, and that's the right idea. Uh, but the execution of this here leaves a lot to be desired. I was being tagged on Twitter by people who received the letters and were asking whether or not it was a phony letter or some type of voter intimidation or suppression. And I saw the front page of the Daily News today. Uh, so, you know, clearly um, this could have been executed in a much better way. I mean, the Board of Elections is saying, and I haven't had a conversation with the mayor or the Board of Elections. Um, the Board of Elections is saying if they, if they just used their list, it would have showed which voters to actually contact. But instead, the third party vendor um, did something with that list themselves, which affected who got the letter. So, you know, we don't want people being confused. And if people are confused coming out of this, we need to correct that right away and ensure that this doesn't happen again. I think it probably would have been better if the uh, the office that was in charge of this, that was just staffed up, uh, went directly and spoke with the management and senior level folks at the Board of Elections to have a conversation about how to get this information out there, given the concern. You know, the mayor offered the Board of Elections uh, a significant amount of money in the budget a couple of years ago uh, to adopt some reforms. The Board of Elections refused to do that. Sadly, most of the things that we would like to do on the in reforming the Board of Elections were preempted by state law, like on too many things uh, in the city. And so it would help if the state legislature passed significant reforms that we can't pass, and then the mayor would be able and we would be able to work with the Board of Elections on not having this level of confusion moving forward. Katie? I think it's a good idea. I think the when the mayor announces as part of his State of the City in February, he was trying to, in the wake of low voter participation, get the city to engage with more people and make voting easier by giving them information necessary. The New York City Campaign Finance Board has a section that's part of it that really just has to do with uh, encouraging people to vote, and it's called the Voter Assistance uh, committee, uh, commission, the VAC, and so they've supposed to do that in the past. Uh, I want to ensure there's no redundancy between what CFB is supposed to be doing and what this new office is doing, but I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think if we're going to be spending taxpayer dollars, we should be um, really specific and uh, thoughtful about how we spend taxpayer money on this. Rich? You know, we haven't had that conversation yet. Uh, this just, I think, came out uh, yesterday is when I started to read about it. I'm sure there'll be conversations here um, about that, but I, of course, I would want to speak to uh, the chair of the committee, Chair Cabrera of the Government Operations Committee, as well as uh, some of the other council members who have been working on this issue. You know, we, uh, it's not our Charter Revision Commission, but we're participating in a Charter Revision Commission and uh, I called for a broad look at the city charter, and I think some of the things that they're looking at are things that the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission didn't put on the ballot, like instant runoff voting and other things to make voting easier in New York City. So I think it's a much bigger conversation, um, but you know, we um, will conduct, as we always do, uh, rigorous oversight. Yeah,
I didn't think of that, uh, but I think those are totally fair questions and we should be transparent about who we sent these out to, uh, what parameters were used. What, just from what I read, I read that, I think it was called Civis or Civitas or whatever the Civis, uh, the, I don't know them, uh, that they kind of took the list and resynthesized it themselves before they sent it out. And so I think we deserve answers on how they did that, what criteria they used, who it went to. So I think those are totally fair questions. And I'm sure members of the council would want to have the answer to that. So we are open to, to, to looking at this in a deeper dive moving forward. Rosa? There's so much to say on this. Uh, it's complicated. Um, it's complicated, but it's not complicated in some ways that this is so tragic and sad and it's hard to even believe the numbers. I think many folks remember uh, five years ago, the big New York Times long story on Dasani Coates and people saw that as sort of a watershed moment in the city following the life of a young homeless girl and the uh, um, challenges that she faced being homeless and being in the shelter system. And then what we've seen is f almost five years later, the problem has gotten exponentially worse. So I am really proud that um, the chair of the Land Use Committee, uh, Councilmember Salamanca, has been a real leader in his own district and has been encouraging other members and upping the homeless set aside from 5% to 10% for affordable housing projects going through ULERP in their own district. Um, I think that's a really good thing. I think we do need to increase the number, the set aside for homeless individuals. We're not gonna get ahead of this problem, not just for children. And with that number that we're talking about, the over 100,000, that number includes children who are living in the shelter system themselves, but also, uh, families and children who are doubling up with other family members or friends or grandparents who are unstably housed. When you look at just the folks in the shelter system, it's about 23,000 children under the age of 16 years old, I believe. And that's heartbreaking to believe that in a population of, uh, the overall shelter population is about 63,000 on a given night, fluctuating between 61 and 63,000, that more than a third are children under the age of 16 years old. Now the family population is going down a little bit and we've been able to rehouse about 100,000 people, but the number is still remains stagnant, um, mostly because the single adult population is going up. So it's a very complicated, you can't talk about homelessness in a sound bite really, because it's so layered and complicated with so many factors. But the council cares deeply about this, every member here every single member here cares deeply about this, and we're gonna keep working on it, but I think the homeless set-aside should be increased. So they're calling to up the number to 30,000, I believe, and um, I, I don't see anything wrong with that number. You know, I wanna have some deeper conversations. I haven't had a chance to have a sit down with those advocates myself to ask them questions and I haven't had the opportunity, just given how overwhelmed and busy I've been, to have the conversation here um, with the amazing staff. Uh, but I, it sounds like a good number to me and I think one of the things that uh, Chair Salamanca and, and I will do as well is whenever there is a project that's coming forward, we should be, we should be individually as council members in our own districts, increasing the number of units for homeless family and supportive housing units. Both of those things would go a significant way to having a long-term effect. I mean, there's no way to fully predict this, but I think that if we don't do this, if we don't increase the set aside, we're likely not gonna get out of this 
shelter popula population plateau for potentially years. And so we need to start putting more units online because when it comes through ULERP, the building's not opening up in six months. The building's opening up a year, a year and a half, two years later. So it's gonna take a while to actually get those families out of the shelter then placed into these new developments. Any other off topic questions? Okay, I wanna let Councilmember Cornegy speak about uh, his bill that he has today. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Of course. Congratulations. Thank you. So um, I'm glad you let me uh, speak at the end. Um, listen, this is a very important topic to myself, my family, and to uh, nursing mothers and recent mothers across the city. So as a husband and father of six children, I believe strongly that women should be supported as new mothers to breastfeed their children. They should have access to safe, clean, sanitary spaces to breastfeed their children. I was proud to open the first public lactation station in the government office in this city in my district office in 2015, and I'm proud today to speak about intro 878, which would expand the provision of safe lactation stations to nursing moms across this city. In 2016, I was proud to be the prime sponsor of intro 1063, now local law 94, which required DOHMH to provide dedicated lactation rooms for nursing mothers in all their health centers, as well as in job centers, SNAP centers, and medical assistance program centers of DSS and HRA. Among others, intro 878 will expand the provision to make lactation spaces available to the public in police precincts and in city jails that accept visitors. Where it's not practicable, NYPD and DOC will be required to submit an explanation as to why and how they intend to expand access to lactation spaces. In the past few days, we've become aware of a lawsuit filed against the NYPD by one of their own officers who was forced to express breast milk for her newborn in a truly deplor deplorable condition and contracted mastitis after she was not provided adequate accommodation to do so by her supervisors. To say this is frustrating is an understatement. For me, this is personal. After the birth of my twin boys, my wife was forced to express breast milk in the laboratory at her place of work. And it is this experience that led me to press for laws in the city that protect the safety and health of working mothers with infant children. I'm proud today to say we as a council have gotten out in front of this issue and will be passing both my bill, intro 878, as well as Majority Leader Cumbo's bill, 879, to make access to safe sanitar sanitary lactation rooms a right of working mothers and moms throughout this city. Every day we in government espouse the importance of giving our children the best opportunity to succeed in life. As we've become increasingly aware of the myriad of benefits associated with breastfeeding, it's only appropriate that we do everything in our power to stick to our word. And this means empowering moms to be able to safely and healthily breastfeed their children. Nursing mothers deserve to have access to a safe, clean, comfortable space to breastfeed or express breast milk. If we care about the health and well-being of our children, then we have to care about, then we have to care about the health and well-being of their mothers too. These bills demand the support of anyone who cares about the future of our children and I look forward to them becoming law. I wanna thank uh, Helen Rosenthal for her leadership in the Women's Committee and I wanna thank my speaker, Corey Johnson, for always being at the forefront and pushing us as a council to do better and be better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Any questions for Council McCorning here? Any continuation of off-topic questions? Great, thank you all very much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.